daunting task to follow Jeffrey Sachs on the podium, and I'm sure I won't do it justice, but I'd like to say a few words about science, and then about the institutional responses that science has begun to mobilize that were actually mentioned in the closing remarks of Jeffrey Sachs. He just... Uh... So, <clears throat> why is science important? Well, science is the world's most powerful means of knowledge creation, and <clears throat> it deals exclusively with arguments based on evidence, and the results of science have to be subject to in independent confirmation. This ties us together as a community, and it makes science the premier source of new knowledge. The difference between science and technology is that science provides the fundamental knowledge that lead to technological innovations from you know, the beginnings of the um, guess still, from <laughs> the beginnings of the industrial revolution through the transportation revolution and forward. I think there's every reason to believe that the history of the last 200 years and vast accumulation of scientific knowledge will continue, especially as the global investment in basic scientific research is continuing to grow. And from that will flow a lot of unimagined technological innovations that will affect the future. But there is no guarantee that these new technologies and innovations will solve problems of sustainability or poverty eradication. And to do that, there has to be a larger effort to develop policies and incentives to direct innovations towards these twin goals. So how, how do we do that? Who speaks for science? Who can address those who really are the global decision makers? And looking at the history of the, of the United States, there are a series of different ways in which the decision makers of the country get scientific advice. One is informal advice from respected experts. A great example is the letter that Albert Einstein wrote to uh, President Roosevelt advocating an uh, atomic bomb project. There's also a lot of inside the government advice from science agencies that are part of the government. So in the, in the U.S. we don't have a ministry of science, but we have science spread through a large number of departments of government which have their own experts. A great example is the U.S. Geological Survey, Department of Agriculture, Department of Energy, and many others. And then there's external sources of, of scientific advice, um, think tanks such as RAND or the Brookings Institution or many others that have emerged in this advice business uh, during the post-World War II era. I'll say a word about academies because that's my, my special bias. Um, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences was actually formed during the American Civil War and what was unique about that academy was that it was formed with a service mission rather than just uh, to promote scientific communication and to recognize scientific achievement. And the service mission was to, whenever called upon by any department of government, to investigate, examine, experiment, and report upon any subject of science or art that was of interest to the government, but to do so without compensation. So why are academies useful and important tools in this effort to transform society and to address the environmental crisis? First, they're merit-based and typically include the scientific leadership of a country. They're self-renewing institutions that are typically free from political interference and they have the credibility to inform the public and policymakers about looming problems and potential solutions. So what can science communities do to promote a better future? Science academies can be effective in arguing for the use of science and technology knowledge in policy development. 
academy leaders often have access to high levels decision makers. That's especially true in the developing world, in my experience. And most nations regard their S&T assets as essential for a better future. So let me now turn uh, to a few remarks on the issue of environmental sustainability. The notion of sustainability grew out of the Brundtland Commission, which was actually uh, a United Nations Commission thir more than 30 years ago. And as Jeffrey Sachs indicated, the d definition of sustainability was an intergenerational definition given here development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But in the, but there's a, a time scale issue in changing the policy environment. In the 30 years since the Brundtland Commission, the world has grown from about 4.5 billion people to about 7.3 billion people, representing a more than 60% increase in the global population with relatively little progress made on addressing the large issues of environmental sustainability. Now, the time scale is that population has grown very rapidly through this period. Climate change and water resource issues and other major sustainability challenges are moving on a time scale which is much more rapid than the time scale a policy response to these challenges. The U.S. National Academy has done quite a bit of work in the sustainability area. I've just picked out a couple of old reports, one on sustaining marine fisheries. Another interesting report that was actually done 15 years ago uh, asking how to create a science of sustainability. But these have not had a large impact. Um, Kind of an interesting side story though on this, our common journey report is that it stimulated a Texas oilman named George Mitchell to give the Academy $20 million to establish a sustainability program. Now, George Mitchell happens to be the, the primary architect of hydraulic fracturing. So <laughs> there's an irony that uh, Mitchell was quite committed to environmental sustainability. Um, so why is the assimilation of scientific knowledge into policy so slow? Well, first of all, science works slowly. The foundational knowledge uh, doesn't occur in revolutions, typically. A process of repeatability and confirmation in the scientific community take time until there's a, a consensus about the validity of results within the community. The channels between science and policy are very noisy. There are many different individuals and institutions who claim to speak for science, often with different voices, different agendas, different purposes. And, and finally, policymakers need broad syntheses, while most scientists work on narrowly defined problems. So most of us are not well adapted to presenting the sorts of broad syntheses that aid policymakers in formulating approaches to major global problems. So it's essential that the science community become more effective in communicating appropriate evidence-based policy options to governments and decision makers. And one of the Important issues to understand is that with regard to environmental issues, most decisions are made at the national level or the local level. There is no global governance that can force changes in environmental policy. So we have to be able to affect individual governments one at a time. And this brings me to the final part of my presentation, which is the power of networks. The, as indicated at the very end of Jeffrey Sachs's talk, uh, the global scientific community has joined in a global network of science academies to try and address issues in a way that represents the scientific consensus to the governments of the individual members. So, <clears throat> 
There are academies in most countries. There are a natural node in every country, or almost every country, for carrying policy advice to high levels of government. Academies include typically the science leadership of countries and can reach high level decision makers. And working together, academies can influence policy on key issues. Now, I'd like to say just a couple of words about the efforts here in the Americas. There's an organization called the Inter-American Network of Academies of Sciences. The creation of this organization was created only 10 years ago in 2004, but the creation of it was led by Latin America. The, the original architects of the program were Ernan Chaimovich, together with the help of Marcus Cortesal here in Brazil. Today, the organization is uh, largely sustained by the member academies, and the Mexican Academy of Sciences makes by far the largest contribution, about twice the contribution of the United States. So this is very much an organization which is led from Latin America, but includes the entire hemisphere from Canada in the north down to Chile and Argentina in the south. And these are the logos of some of the academies that are members of the IONIS network. So what does it do? Well, it tries to address some of these global issues, and, but to bring them to national governments through their academies. One of the resource issues that the, that the IONIS network has focused on is water resources and sustainability. Uh, this effort has once again been uh, uh, initiated and led from Brazil, is now uh, led also from Nicaragua. Catherine here is one of the leaders of it. And it's actually done a number of things. It's created, it uh, has uh, written a thoughtful analysis of water resource issues throughout the Americas. It's um, going to be publishing in the next couple of months a book on urban water challenges. This, part, this hemisphere is one of the most urbanized geographic regions on the earth. And urban water challenges are a very big issue for the Americas. Uh, another thing that it very recently did, less than a month ago, um, a workshop was hosted in Managua by the Nicaraguan Academy of Sciences with support from IONIS and also support from the International Council for Science to try and look at scientific questions of, associated with sustainability issues presented by the development of a transoceanic canal through Nicaragua, both environmental sustainability and issues of economic sustainability. Um, so Giannis has tried to work to affect policy throughout the Americas. It focuses also on human resource development, on the advancement of women in science. This is a book of biographies which was published about a year ago in both Spanish and English. Uh, there's a biography of prominent of one prominent woman scientist from each of the academies in the IONIS network. And uh, it's actually gotten more than 46,000 downloads, uh, the PDF from the website. We also work on advancing science education in the hemisphere. So one of the approaches is a globalized, or in this case, a regionalized approach to use the connections in the science community to reach individual national governments on these critical issues. And this effort is just in its infancy, uh, but I think it has great promise and we can do much more. Thank you.